Jeff was telling me um, there in the office that you was, you was in contact with the Gideons about the Bible. Went online, looked at, and they are, they are offering New King James, NIVs, and, drum roll please, the Message Bible from the Gideons. Now, I don't get that because to publish the King James Bible doesn't cost them anything. There's no, outside of the UK, there's no copyright on the King James. You can print it all you want to free of charge. But when it comes to the NIV or the New King James, NIV is owned by Zondervan, New King James owned by Thomas Nelson. I don't know who owns the Message Bible. Those are all copyrighted and they charge to have them printed. You have to pay them money. So my thinking is, I bet you those companies either donate that free of charge to the Gideons and don't charge them, to get them to print their Bibles or the Gideons are having to pay for that, the right to print them so they can print them and give them out. Either way, there's somebody behind the scenes pushing these fake Bibles. And I'm telling you, wherever these Bibles are, there is zero discernment by people. No discernment whatsoever. Wherever these Bibles are, people do not acknowledge, the di they cannot tell the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil, between clean and unclean. And that's what God said in His Word, was that a drunken spirit will cause that. They have no discernment whatsoever. Do, cannot tell. So that's why, that's why right now the United Methodist, I don't know if you know this or not. The United Methodist denomination is meeting right now. And where they're meeting, there's protests. Because they're trying to discern whether or not to allow lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer. That's the LGBTQ. That's their terminology. They use the terminology queer. They are, the United Methodists are meeting right now to determine whether or not to allow all the churches to embrace LGBTQ or to leave it up to the individual churches whether or not they want to recognize LGBTQ or they will just force all United Methodist churches to embrace LGBTQ. Meaning, that they have absolutely no discernment whatsoever when it comes to LGBTQ. Where does that come from? It comes from a lack of the presence of the Word of God. It's where that comes from. You mark it down. Bible preachers saw this coming years ago preached against it, warned about it, and we're in that age right now. When an entire denomination cannot discern whether it is right or wrong to be a sodomite. When they cannot discern that, there is a lack of the presence of the Word of God there. So, what a world we live in. Anybody else? I appreciate that, Melissa. I appreciate you just send them a Bible, show them the verses to read, and say, read these verses, and let God do the rest. Ron? Pray for your sister. Okay, we'll do that. Her name is Judy. I know somebody by that name. I know somebody who says that's their name and it's not their real name. <laughs> Amen. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pray for one another. Uh, you folks online, pray for us. We will pray for you folks online. And prayer is one, is part of the threefold cord. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. There are many needs that are represented in this place tonight. 
We ask you, God, that you hear those that call upon you. And God, that you would answer the prayers of those who call out, who cry out unto you. God teaches that praying's easy. Praying, Lord, is just simply crying out to you. Calling out to you. God, you did not institute nor initiate any form or any regulation or any format upon how we call upon you. You just said to call upon you. And Father, I found that talking to you is as easy as talking to my best friend, talking to a king, talking to a brother. And Father, we thank you for the ability to come boldly before the throne of grace, to ask you, Lord, for favors, to ask you, Lord, for help, ask you, Lord, for guidance, ask you for forgiveness, ask you, Lord, for light to guide us in the path that we're to go in. To close every door, Lord, you would not want us to go down. To open every door of every path that you want us to go down. To make life just that easy to follow you. Father, I pray, dear God, you bless all of those that are with us online tonight. Father, I thank you, Lord, for their presence. Thank you, Lord, for their fellowship, their encouragement. Pray, Lord, that you'd bless them tonight. Father, I thank you for these that are gathered here with us tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them and hear their prayer tonight. Lord, Father, visit those, Lord, that we are praying for to be saved. Father, show them the way, the way you showed us the way. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless and honor your word tonight. Open it up for us, for our hearing, for our attentiveness. Father, for our learning. I pray, dear God, that that threefold cord of your word and prayer, Lord, and church attendance. God, that you'd just bless us tonight as we open up your word. Keep us close to one another. Help us, dear God, as we fellowship to love one another, to forgive one another, to pray for one another, encourage one another, even so much more as we see the day approaching. Father, just bless us tonight as we go through your word. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Let me go back here just a little bit to get our bearings. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so this I call the Christian's threefold cord. Number one, Bible. Bible reading. Not just having a Bible. You don't just have a Bible and think, that just having a Bible is going to do it. It means an open Bible that you read. God makes it as simple as that. Have your Bible. We have Bibles everywhere in this country. If you want a Bible, you can get a Bible. You can go to the dollar store and get a King James Bible for one dollar. Amen. It's that easy. They have them there. And if you want one for a dollar, we can send you a dollar King James Bible. That's a little tiny, but it's a little hard to read, but it's there. You can read it and it costs a dollar. Amen. Now, if you want one of them $50 Bibles, have somebody give you $50. Amen. <laughs> okay. But just a Bible, just a Bible to read, or you can download the software, purebiblesearch.com. And you can have you a free Bible online. Download it. You can put it on your phone, put it on your tablet, put it on your computer. Free of charge. And tell God thank you for Donna who, put, who made that available to us. Amen. So number one, the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. Number two, prayer. Okay, evening, morning, and at noon. Will I pray, cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Uh, let's pick it up here. In the book of Job, chapter 33, the Bible says, She shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. He shall see his face with joy. He shall render unto the man his righteousness. Psalm 5, verse 2, Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. 
Psalm 32, 6, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Matthew 21, 22, In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. I would love for you to just get a hold of that verse. Where's my pen? I've lost my little marker pen. Did I put that in my pocket? Some? Did I, did I put it up on the pulpit? I think I've lost it. I hope I haven't. Hang on a second. Ah! Right where I left it last. You got to open up your Bible to Matthew 21, 22 and underline that verse. And if you need to read it three times a day, read it three times a day. And all things. What does all things mean? Means there's not any area of life that you cannot pray about. Amen, Joanna. Joanna says amen. Joanna is proof tonight. Proof that if you ask God, He'll hear you. Amen? All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. In fact, turn to, um, I'm going to go off script. Turn to John 15. John 15. I'm going to show you something from your Bible tonight. John chapter 15, this is where Jesus said, I'm the true vine and my father a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he shall take away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Verse 6, And if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I would not like to be in a situation where God cast me off. Verse 7, and this is where you just believe what God said. You may not understand how it works, but you believe it. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Now, back in verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. Now here's the key. When God's word is abiding in you, then your will falls in line with God's will. And when his word lives and rules in you, then all of a sudden your, what you want and what you will in life is exactly how God wants it in your life. And you can ask, and God will bless, and God will give you, or He'll give you better than what you asked for. I'm Listen, I've been through this in life. I've studied this issue of prayer at one time in my, in my life and in my ministry. I wanted to know how prayer worked in a believer's life. So, I mean, I went to town. I went to the Word. I studied the Word. God began to open up things to me. God began to show me things. And I'm just telling you that if your life and your mind is right according to God's word, then your will and God's will coincide. You won't be asking anything outside of God's will. You'll be asking for things that glorify God. And when you do that, God will just give you what you ask for. Amen. Because what you're asking for is not outside of God's will. Let me give an example. Let's say that. Oh I don't know. Let's say that J.R. is saying. God. I want you to give me a new set of parents. Huh? Okay. You might have prayed that yesterday. Alright. But here is God. God. 
will not necessarily give JR a new set of parents. God will work in JR's life so that in JR's mind, the parents that he has is okay with him. And then he has, in his mind, his prayer answered. Because now his life is right with God and his parents are okay in his mind and everything. The whole universe is set right. Amen? So anyway, pray often. Now there's a lot of verses up here on the screen. Now I'm going to read them to you real fast. Luke 18, 1. He spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 22, 40. And when he is at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Acts 6, 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. You know what that means? Situation pops up in life and your first response to it is to pray. Not your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth response, but your first initial response to that situation is to pray. God, show me what you want me to do about this situation. God, show me what your will is concerning this situation and I'll do it. God, you lead me and then I'll follow you and the whole world, the whole universe will be set right. So continue, uh, Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Defraud ye not the one, not one the other. That's concerning a married couple. Except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So he included fasting and prayer. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Colossians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Do not cease to pray for people. You got a situation that you can't handle? Pray. You got people you don't know how to deal with? pray you've got issues with somebody you pray colossians 4 2 continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving thanksgiving should always be included in every prayer that you pray you say well i serve god i have nothing tell god thank you tell god thank you God brought that about in your life for some reason, somehow, some way. Tell God, thank you. Continue in prayer. First Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Well, how can I pray and not stop praying? How can that happen? Any advice? Any suggestions? Yes, Sister Sandy? Not bad. If it happens, God brought it about. Did he not? God allowed it to happen. God brought it about. And you're either going to learn from it. You're going to live through it. God's going to show you something with it. You might as well tell God thank you for it. And, keep it. and prayer does not always mean get on your knees, bow your head, close your eyes so you can pray. You can pray driving a car. You can pray while you're working. In fact, our forefathers got up early in the morning. They read the Bible. When they went out to do their daily work, they thought about those things they read in the Bible, and they talked to God. And God communed back with them through the word that they read. Either that day or the day before, the day before that, or the week before that, or the year before that. But they learned how to live, to walk with God, and to pray always throughout their day. So continue in prayer. Pray without ceasing. 1 Timothy 2.1 I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. In fact, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to show you something. 
First Timothy chapter two. Let me show you what it says after that. He said, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now look at verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Do you think that Paul prayed for kings? You think Paul prayed for Caesar? Paul was a Roman citizen. Of course he did. You think Paul prayed for men that he knew governed over him? Absolutely. And what was the intent? That he could live a quiet and peaceable life without the government always being on him all the time, demanding things of him or trying to control and manipulate him. Paul said, pray, no matter what form of government you're under, Pray for those who rule over you so that you may be able to live a quiet and peaceable life and still be a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, and pray always that the government's not always trying to stab you in the back all the time. So that's what, and then verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. God's will is that everybody has the right to be saved. Amen? Now, does that mean everybody's going to be saved? Nope. But God wants it that way. And if God wants it that way, why shouldn't we want the same thing? If you remember several years ago, when Barack Obama became president... I would say to our church, pray that Barack Obama knows Jesus as his Savior. I say the same thing about Donald Trump. That man needs to be saved. He needs to be right with God. So that instead of telling everybody, let's, uh, let's all get along with the Sodomites. Somehow, someway, God would lead in him to be righteous and to be holy, and he would lead the nation in righteousness, even though people would hate, people hate his guts anyway. Might as well hate them for the right reason, amen? First Timothy 2, 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Is there anything wrong that while you're in the service, while you're in the church house and the preacher's preaching and the spirit moves, do you see anything wrong with lifting up your hand toward heaven? Not a thing. Not a thing. And I've heard preachers, oh, we don't want that. That looks Pentecostal. Who cares? Amen? If you're sitting in this church and you feel like the Spirit is on you and you just want to raise and lift up holy hands, go ahead. Amen? Because I'd rather you be here when the Spirit gets a hold of you than for you to be in somebody else's church when the Spirit gets a hold of you. Amen? I'd rather it be here. So how often should we pray? Without ceasing. Turn to the book of James. Does somebody have a mint, peppermint, something with Sugar in it. I could use a little sugar. That doesn't mean come up and kiss me on the cheek. Huh? Oh, thank you. Oh, that looks good. That's got, that's uh, St. Louis Cardinals candy. I like that. There we go. Man, I'm getting it all over the place. You can't have this one. Why not? That's butterscotch. That's the kind of stuff I like. James chapter 5. There. Kind of hard to preach with candy in your mouth. James chapter 5 verse 13. 
Is any among you afflicted? Let him what? You guys hear that on the internet? I wish that everybody that watches us that needed healing could come here and we'd lay hands on them, put oil on them, pray with them. Can't always be that way. So if you're sick and you're alone, what do you do? Pray. Or ask God. Is it absolutely vitally necessary that you be here so you can have hands laid on you and an oil anointed? No. John was in exile on the Isle of Patmos and went to church every Sunday by himself. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the Bible says, and Jesus himself showed up there. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. I believe when you're alone and you feel like singing, you ought to sing. Who can, in fact, if you can't sing, you're all alone. Who cares? Amen. Whether you're in the car and the music's good, sing. Amen. My mother. I love my mother. Her mother could sing beautiful. But her mother decided not to give that to her. She decided to give it to her grandkids. But my mom would sing in the car no matter what. Me and Melissa would join right in, help her out. Huh? Overpower. We made a good little trio there in the car, didn't we? Didn't matter to her, she'd sing anyway. Does any marry? Let him sing songs. Any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now watch this. And the prayer of faith shall what? Save the sick. Didn't say he'd had to be healed. Didn't say right then and there that he was going to be healed without a doubt. But God will save him. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he committed sins, what? They shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now, he did not say confess your sins. One to another. So it's not, it's not mandatory that if you do something wrong that you got to call for somebody in the church. i got to tell you what I did. Oh, it's bad. Sometimes not everybody needs to hear that. But you'll hear me while I'm preaching confess faults. Why? Because I have them. And I want you to be part of a church where it's okay if somebody confesses that they're at fault. Because that makes a good church. Amen? And pray for one another that you may be healed. Here it is. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Look at verse 17. Elias. Who is Elias? Elijah. Was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So how many times. I've said this before. How many times you have to pray. But. And I'm going to Trish. I'm going to use you for an example. If it's worth it to you. How many times will you pray? All day, all night, next day, next night. If she's worth it to you, you'll pray. Amen? If it's worth it to you, you'll pray. You'll ask God, and you'll ask God, and you'll ask God. And you'll ask God. And then at some point, you'll have to trust God. Especially when He doesn't give the answer right then and right there. You have to trust Him. That God knows both 
how to answer the prayer. See, I've done this one. I've said, God, I love you, and I'm worried. So I'm coming to you. And God, I'm going to say to you that it doesn't matter to me what you do as long as you do it. But God, I don't want to be angry at you. So God, when you answer this prayer, make sure that I'm not mad at you. God will honor that. He'll bless that. Did you know it's okay to tell God your feelings? You know who He is to us? He's wonderful. And He's a counselor. A counselor is someone you tell your feelings to. Somebody you tell when you're hurt or when things aren't going well. Or when you're not right. And you tell God. God wants to hear about it. He, he cares about your feelings. He cares about your emotions. He wants you. He said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He's not come to put you down every day. Anyway, I got to move on. So Elijah prayed one time. It didn't rain for three and a half years. He prayed again. Rained right then and there. And the earth brought forth her fruit. He ended the famine after three and a half years with one prayer. So who is Elijah? He was somebody just like me and you. And yet he prayed and God heard him. First Peter chapter 3. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Underline that verse in your Bible. Lindsay Renee. Underline that verse in your Bible. Huh? Well, don't do it in that Bible. The eyes of the Lord over the righteous. Now, who's the righteous? Who's the righteous? Huh? The saints? But how are they righteous? The righteousness of Christ. So this verse is to all of those upon whom the righteousness of Christ is on. So the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But those that do evil and insist on doing evil, you think God, and let me help you with something, you think God is just letting them get by with all their evil stuff. He's not. He's not. Alicia, they arrested R. Kelly. You hear about that? She told me about R. I said, who's R. Kelly? Got all these women that are surviving R. Kelly. Well, he finally got arrested. They'll get him. And if they don't, God will. We don't have to worry about how bad the wicked are getting away with all their wickedness. Let them go. God will get them. Amen? You believe your Bible? Say amen. amen. 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Jude one twenty. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Ghost? In tongues? Is that it? Praying in the Holy Ghost means... That your mind, your heart is set according to the word of God. The word of God says, when God says, um, I'm thinking to let God be true in every, in every man a liar, but that's not what I'm trying to think of. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So you will hear me pray. God, do what honors and pleases you in your kingdom First, when you pray in accordance with God's will, you will always get your prayers answered. 
Always. Matthew 17, oh, watch this. Matthew 17, 21, Mark 9, 29. Jeff, those verses are missing out of every Bible except the King James. How be it, this kind goes not out, but by prayer and... He said to them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And isn't it amazing that those two verses have been mysteriously wiped out of all the modern translations. No wonder these churches are now saying, LGBTQ, come on in. We'll even let you be our ministers. Because their houses are full of devils. And they can't get rid of them. I gotta chew this up, making me spit all over the place. Turn to Isaiah 58. For those of you who have ever wondered what fasting and praying is all about, Isaiah 58, 58 spells it out very well. God said, in verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now remember, it's all about God's kingdom first. So if you're going to, let's say that God's laying it on your heart to fast. Okay? And I'm going to recommend that... Either God, you really feel like God's leaning on your heart to fast, but you're not sure why, or there are, there are issues that to you are important enough to fast. Let me tell you what fasting is not for. Weight loss. God couldn't care less if you're going to use fasting to drop a few pounds so you can fit back into your jeans. God could not care less about that. that. has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Okay? Fasting is not about weight loss. Fasting is not about purifying your flesh. It has nothing to do with that. Fasting to me is a serious, serious business. Because it, it is you telling your flesh no on everything. You're denying the basic desires and wants of your flesh. You're telling your flesh no. So, what is fasting good for? The kingdom of God. This is the fast. God said this fast that I have chosen. Number one, to loose the bands of wickedness. So let's say that you have a serious issue going on in your life with sin. And you've tried everything in the world. And nothing, nothing works. Fast fast and pray now i'm also going to say this too i do not recommend fasting while you're going to work tell me why where's your mind it's on working when you're at work that boss owns you and god knows that okay if you're going to fast then everything else in your life Moves out of the way. Now God don't have a problem you taking a day off. You're going to take a day off. You're going to fast, take a day off. But I do not recommend fasting while you go about your business and go about your work. If you're going to fast, you're going to fast and pray. Because fasting and praying, here's, here's how I do it. I fast and I pray and I read scriptures. I read scripture for a while. Then I'll pray. I'll read scripture for a while. Then I'll pray. And then I'll read scripture for a while. Then I'll pray. Nothing else. No phone calls. Don't tweet. Get off, fast off Facebook for all day long. That'll help you. Some of you are going, I can't, I just can't do it. Okay. Number one, loose the bands of wickedness. Number two, undo the heavy burdens. Undo the heavy burdens. 
Number three, to let the oppressed go free. Maybe you're fasting and praying for somebody else to be made free. To let the oppressed go free. Number four, that you break every yoke. So let's say the devil's got you in a headlock. And you're sick and tired of it. Fast and pray. Fast, pray, read the Bible. Separate yourself from the world. Turn the phone off. Turn the TV off. Don't go about your daily business. Don't worry about what everything else is going on in the world. Take a day off work. Whatever it takes. But that day is set aside for you and God. I've fasted before. I've, this most serious fast I ever got into, I've, I've talked about it many times, was the beginning of this ministry, 2008. In the morning I'd come in, they all saw me. I was in my office. I was fasting and I was praying. I would break the fast in the evening. And the next day, back at it again. And I had already told God, I was at a point where I said, God, you've got to do something. If you want me to quit, tell me to quit and I'll quit. You want me to get out of the ministry? Tell me to get out of the ministry. I'll get out of the ministry. You want me to leave this church? Tell me to get out of this church. I'll get out of this church. But you are going to do something with me. I'm going to wrestle with you. And me and you is going to go back and forth until you release me or you bless me. You're going to do this. And by the third day, I mean, I was serious about it. I was not going to stop. Until God did something with this church. And that's what it was about. It was about me and this church. If God would have told me after three days that he was done with me here, I would have rolled on down the road, done something else. But I don't, I didn't care. By the third day, I see, I was writing down ideas, what I could do. Well, I could do this. Maybe I could do this in ministry. Maybe our church could do this. I'd write it down, scratch it out. Write it down, scratch it out. Nothing, nothing came to me. And even after three days, I had no idea what I was going to do, what God was going to do. But God released me from the fast. Two weeks later, something, I can't remember what it was, but something just really hit me again. I went back into it again. I said, God, I'm serious. I'm going to wrestle with you and I'm not going to stop. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of living like this. I'm tired of it being like this. I've, I've had it. I'm done. And then... Well, we had a school and daycare and God laid it on my heart. We closed that down. And then I felt relieved. But I had no idea what I was going to do. And then about two weeks, it was about two weeks after that, that I woke up one morning, getting ready to come here. Boom. Watchman video broadcast, Jeff. And that's, I did the very first one. Right after that, and it went off from there. So here we are, probably going to feed five, six hundred people next week after next. Thousands of people listening in Kenya, people all over the country, people all over the world. Got a family. I just talked to the man the other day in India. Very faithful family. And I love this man. He's very sensitive to what God wants in his life. He's very concerned about what he does and how he does things he's very sensitive because in everything he does he wants to please god he wants to bring and you don't find to me people like that but he, he calls me every now and then asks me about certain things in life what should i be doing this should i be doing that and sometimes I, I say i don't you know i don't know what to tell you but if you think god's leading you this way then i would do it and see what happens and you run into people like that you run into god's people you run into faith faithful people and that's what i love and I'm just saying to you that whoever you are, whatever the situation, there's four things here that God promised he would do. Loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. He said, is it not to deal thy, thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? Is that, that's what we're doing. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. And I'm just saying to you, when these things are important enough to you, when they are serious enough to you, you will fast. And you will pray. And this is part of that unbreakable 
threefold cord that God will hold you with. God will keep you from sin with these things. I did not even get into church going. I'll wait. Because I want to spend some time with this. I don't want to just run through it. I want to spend some time with this. I like to spend time with the Word of God. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. But not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Turn, turn there real quick. I'm going to do this verse and I'll let you go. Hebrews 10, verse 21. And if you don't turn there, I'm not going to let you go. So you better turn there. I better hear them pages going. There we go. See, I got my blood sugar back up. I'm ready to go now. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 21. And having a high priest over the house of God. See, our high priest is Christ. Watch this now. He is over the house of God. You know what that means? It's not your church and it's not my church. It is the house that belongs to God. So we have a high priest over the house of God here. Then let us draw near with a true heart. So why are you going to church? What's your motivation? Is it because you want to be seen? Is it because you want to look religious on Sunday? So you can say to all your business contacts and you can say to all your people who you're trying to sell stuff to or you can make contacts or, or whatever. You look good in the community. It looks good on your resume. He's a member of such and such church. Let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So, should we here at Bethel have an LGBTQ meeting and decide on whether or not we're going to let sodomites get married here, we're going to let them preach here, we're going to let them teach Sunday school? Nope. Nope. Our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience. These things ought never to be done in the house of God. And our bodies washed with pure water. What's the pure water? The Word of God. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Which is why we come here. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, God has, I believe God has made it so that each one of you on, on the other side of that camera, you are in fact and in deed and in heart assembling here with us. I believe that. No doubt in my mind about it. Because you do it you do it consistently, you do it in faith, and you have, you have, in essence, made a promise to God that Bethel is your church, and I'm your pastor, and God, I believe, will bless and honor that and bring protection over your life. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Do you know what that means? There are some who forsake it. So those who forsake it, that's on them. You don't forsake it. Exhorting one another and so much the more as you see what day approaching. The day. That day is coming. It's approaching. I don't know about you, but I need more and not less. So I'm, believe it or not, I'm always looking for ways of doing more. So let's stand to our feet. That's your threefold cord. That's what's going to keep you. Bible reading, prayer, church assembly. Can we lose one and still be good? Cord's not as strong. And they're all, it's not a three-stranded cord. It is a three-fold cord. Cord. If you take one, you must take the whole cord. The way I see it. Or it just doesn't work. Have you ever tried 
dropping out of church to see what it would do. I wouldn't want to do it. I wouldn't want that experiment. Okay? I don't think it would work too well. Heavenly Father, you first. You first in everything that we pray about, everything that we read about, every time we get together, it has to be you first. You first in our lives, in our thoughts, in our prayers, our actions. You first, when we come together, we're here, Lord, to worship you, to serve you, to honor you in all things. So God, deliver us from this evil world. Every day, deliver us. Hold us fast with that threefold cord because we know that it is not easily broken. And Father, we're counting on you and we're trusting in you to keep us unto that day. And Father, while we're here, let us be an encouragement to one another to pray for those, Lord, that don't come. Pray for those that don't read their Bible. To pray for those that don't pray themselves. Father, let us be an encouragement and a blessing to others and seek one another first and ourselves last. Bless and honor your word tonight. I love you and I thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.